This presentation was uh, really born from my experience at DEF CON. I competed twice at the SC CTF there, and ever since then I've been adding to this presentation. So if you're interested in the social engineering CTF at DEF CON, this will be of interest. If you just have an interest in social engineering or open source intelligence, this will be interesting as well. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my day job is in aerospace where I do a lot of security. I'm also a volunteer for Coquitlam Search and Rescue where I function as a tracker. I've been doing that for about 10 years. That's relevant just because of the parallels between tracking a person in the bush and then doing OSINT online. It's actually really, really similar in technique. I'm also the founder of Trace Labs. Uh, actually, I, I got on a plane immediately after B-Sides Vancouver uh, where Trace Labs was uh, supporting a CTF there. We do uh, OSINT CTF for missing persons. So we actually, our contestants are looking for real missing persons and we take that data and we give that to law enforcement. So if you're interested in that sort of stuff, check it out. Um, they, there was a documentary made just as I was uh, leaving B-Side. So they were filming all our activity there. So that'll be on YouTube probably in the next month or so. And if you'd like to contact me, if you notice any mistakes in any of my slides or if you have, if you have particular interest in anything, please do uh, hit me on Twitter or send me an email. All right, so there's a lot of good stuff going on here today. Um, what we're going to cover in this room is a basic introduction to social engineering. Uh, I'm going to go through really briefly the DEF CON SECTF. If you want more information on that, uh, let me know, and I can definitely help you prepare for that if you're going to uh, do that. We'll get into open source intelligence, which is personally my favorite right now. Uh, and then we'll get into some vishing techniques and pretexts that I use uh, that were successful. And then how to defend against this sort of thing uh, with your organization. And then everybody wants tools, so I'm going to go over a few tools and some resources that you can check out as well. I like to show this, just so you know what you're going to get. All right, quick disclaimer, um, th these are only my ideas, they, they're not representative of anybody I've worked for or will work for in the future. I just have to get that out of the way. All right, social engineering. Social engineering definition, this is really important. It's uh, The key thing here is the manipulation of somebody to provide you or to do a certain action or provide you with certain information. And you can compare it to, say, influence, which is more of a, a good thing. You can influence somebody to do something, but that's usually in their best interest. So it's not going to be a bad thing for them if somebody finds out that they did that. So you might influence somebody to go for a job interview or take a course or, or do something that's going to help them grow. Manipulation is where you convince somebody to do something that is probably going to be detrimental to their future. Uh, and we see this uh, mostly with evil attackers, so the people who are attacking your organization. Uh, we also see it in some other industries. Um, sometimes you have it in sales uh, and things like that. Anybody in sales here today? Okay, great. Would you put your hand up if, if you were? All right. I talk about sales a little bit in this presentation, so... I'm not against sales, I actually have great respect for sales, but we just sometimes see some of those SE components within the sales industry. So, so what are some examples of social engineering? These are some of the golden oldies that we see, but still actually quite effective today. Uh, impersonation, you walk in as the FedEx person or you're on the phone as the FedEx person or, or somebody else, the janitor, that's the classic. Tailgating, you walk into a building, maybe you're carrying some pizzas or some coffee. Uh, I think I've seen one lately where you, you're a female, you pretend you're pregnant, right? So everybody's going to help that person and hold the door. Still works today. Shoulder surfing, there was an article a couple months ago. It was a big deal. People were looking at some very sensitive information from a company on the bus over the shoulder of the employee. Um, dumpster diving, this is a little bit better today. So we have the shredders, we have the companies that come in and remove your garbage from your office. It's a little bit better, but you could, and a good attack a vector for that would be if somebody comes in and does the impersonation of that company and takes away all your, all your documents. So better, but still the problem hasn't totally gone away. Some current attacks. And these are, this is not the, the complete list, but the focus is now 
on getting more of a, a higher percent success rate through this kind of mass distribution. So of course you have the phishing, the email attack, vishing, smishing, all of these are, are pretty standard. My phone rings probably once a week with the, with an attack. Social en engineering as a service. So all of these are moving to a service. You can get denial of service attack as a service. Uh, this is very cost effective quite often. And then social media impersonation. I love this one and it happens quite often. You'll get on social media. Let's say you're in the lineup to rent a car. It's taking a long time. You're frustrated. You tweet to the company. Oh, I'm very frustrated as a customer. I'll never come back here again. You get a tweet back that says, Oh, we're very sorry. Click on this link and you'll get a discount for the next time you rent a car from us. That's not actually the real company. They just want to harvest your credentials. So what's next? There's a whole bunch of stuff happening now that's really exciting um, that we're seeing on the social engineering side. Virtual kidnapping, where they take your account and they use that for a number of different things. Uh, it starts off with a trusted source so they can pivot from that to then do more things or they can ransom it back to you. Whaling, of course, this is very popular. Saffron Rose was a good example of this. I think it was last, last year. You can read that in the news. Uh, we don't train our executives as much as we probably should. They're the biggest targets and they're super busy. So they're generally pretty easy to trick. Uh, so that, that's definitely an area that's growing. It's profitable. The hybrid attack. This is also one of my favorites. So if you want to do an attack against an entity, it's really great if you can distract them and consume all their defense resources, uh, as a kind of, kind of a first step. So this is great. Do like a vishing or a phishing attack. You'll get some stuff there probably, but really using it as a distraction and then go you do your other attack over here while all those resources are tied up. Uh, espionage baiting. So this is actually a really popular one as well. And I, I don't have the stats for how often this occurs or how often it's successful, but I know it's definitely a concern, especially in the espionage area. So that's when you get an invite to go to a conference, maybe to speak or something like that. Anything that you get is, that is too good to be true, really take a look at that. If they're going to pay for your trip and you get to do all these wonderful things, make sure it's legit. There's a lot of ones out there, a lot of, a lot of these sort of services that are not, that are specifically designed to get information out of you. Uh, fake headhunters is another one. Thousands talent program is a very popular one. I don't know how active they are this year, but last year it was definitely, uh, one of the ones that was out there. So, uh, be very careful of that. It's on, uh, LinkedIn is quite popular for the fake headhunters. There's a lot more, but these are the ones I've seen quite a bit. All right. So what's the origin story for this social engineering thing. So this is where I get into the sales a little bit. You know, it's, it's didn't just arrive in information security all of a sudden. This has been developing, of course, for years, right? If you want to have a crash course, crash course in, in social engineering, go onto a used car lot and just kind of walk around for a little while. Uh, you'll have a bunch of salespeople come up to you and talk to you about buying a car. It's a fantastic experience. Um, just because they're so scripted and as, as far as how they operate and, uh, really the objective there is to get you to buy a car and then also to, for you to spend, uh, you know, as much money as possible to buy that car quite often, right? So really interesting. The people who built the pyramids, I'm sure there was a lot of social engineering there to get all those people to do all that hard work. So it's not a new concept. It's just really been refined over time, uh, and weaponized. So why do we care? It's been around for a while. Why is this a big deal? It's really the one of the number one ways that t attackers now focus on us, right? So 97% of targeted users uh, were targeted through social engineering. Uh, the Verizon report is what I primarily use to get a lot of this data. It's a, it's a very good report to, to pick up these sort of stats, but you can see these anywhere. Uh, the numbers are very high. For any sort of attack, you're typically going to see as the first steps at least, you're going to see your OSINT, and then you're going to see some sort of social engineering. And we don't put a lot of effort or training into really defending against this at this point compared to everything else that we do. One of the jokes that I often make, you know, I, I've got my CISSP, and you have to learn all these different models. The OSI layer model is one of those things, right? And it stops at the at layer 7. And there's no real discussion around the humans, so the joke here is let's add some extra layers 
and, and add the human element into what we're learning here and how to defend. We can talk about, you know, the, the network layer, the transport layer, all those things, but as an attacker, like, I'm going to ignore all that because I know I'm going to call somebody in your company, I'm going to ask them for their password, and then they're going to give it to me. So maybe not the first person or second person or third person, but I'm going to, I'm going to get it. So really, I think we can, we can add a little focus there over time. All right. So I've tried to convince you that social engineering is very important, that the trend is going up, that we can't ignore it. Kevin Mitnick has this, this nice little quote here. The weakest link in the security chain is the human element. Has everybody drank my Kool-Aid? Does everybody believe this so far? Anybody kind of like skeptical? Somebody has to put their hand up, otherwise I won't do a demo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I got some hands back there, perfect. So let's do a quick demo, okay? And this is a ridiculous, stupid demo, but I only have about 30 seconds to do it, okay? So that's why it's not great. And, and the reason I personally don't like doing this demo is because I, I lose either way. If I trick you, I'm a jerk. If I don't trick you, I'm a fraud. So, you know, half the room is going to hate me for one reason or the other. So, but let's do it because it's kind of fun, okay? So let's pretend we're all a company here. Uh, we're all employees and uh, we write a bunch of policies and some people might read them. But one of those policies says uh, we're going to have like a rule because policies basically say you like don't do that, right? And you can do this but not that. So one of our rules will say something visual. So let's say like hand flipping because that's visual. I can see if you do it, Okay. Uh, so there, it's just a one policy is all we've got. That's all we need. It says no hand flipping. Okay. So what we're going to do is, uh, just so that I can see if you flip your hands, just put your hands up in front of you like a zombie. And, um, yeah. Okay. So we're going to start with our hands up. Okay. That's, that's not bad. Actually, you guys are pretty good. So it's this ridiculous trick, right? So I set you up by saying, put your hands up in front of you like a zombie. And then I said, okay, do this. And so some people flipped their hands after I said the policy, don't said, don't flip your hands. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Okay. I only had 30 seconds, but basically it's just a little bit of misdirection, right? And, um, yeah, so I got a couple of people. This is probably the best crowd that I've ever done where, where you didn't flip your hands. So, but a few of you did. So it's just misdirection and, and trying to distract you with one thing while I do another. And, and that's really the biggest trick with social engineering. Uh, one day I'm going to do a really cool magic trick, but that's all I've got so far. So I'm sorry. We'll move on. All right. So if you're still not convinced that social engineering is something we need to invest in, something that's, that's going to actually get, you know, more and more important, even if, you know, if you don't believe it is already, go Google, Google it, take a look at the stats. I highly recommend your company look at a vishing or a phishing program, at least an education program where we, we talk about it within our organization uh, and try to build some defenses around that. It's not going away. All right, so the DEF CON SECTF, a really interesting CTF um, to watch and to also participate in. I've done it twice, came in third both times. Uh, I'm not doing it this year because I'll run a CTF there this year. Um, the reason I like it is because it's not theoretical. You get a real company is your target. And uh, I'm a big fan of non-theoretical exercises. So the stage one, you've got three weeks. I did about 6,000 minutes. You're at home, and there's 16 competitors that get accepted to that. You have a real company. You have 29 flags to collect on that just do it by doing OSINT. It seems like a lot of time, but if you've got a full-time job and a family and other things, it goes by really quick. So... Um, it's a lot of evenings and weekends. The second phase is you show up in DEF CON, you've got 20 minutes in a glass booth in front of hundreds of people where you do vishing against a, a real company. And uh, it's really interesting to see how these companies respond. And um, they're, they're pretty benign flags, which I'll show you, but it's really, you can get a lot from the company and how they're going to respond, how other companies will respond based on that sort of interaction. Real attackers don't typically attack like that today, unless they're whaling, because uh, it takes a lot of energy. And, and uh, But uh, we're definitely going to see more of that in the future, especially with your executives. So the, ex the flags that we see at DEF CON are pretty benign. You can't read this small print probably, but they're things like you know, your cafeteria, who provides your food service? What's your VPN, janitorial service? What kind of OS do you have? How long have you worked for the company? So they don't sound too bad, but even these can be used uh, to do a real attack. 
These are real flags that I would recommend, um, and which would be actually much more valuable. I use the cyber kill chain um, just to give it some sort of structure. But if I was doing this with a real company, I would look for, you know, the environment. What do they have? What are their response capabilities? You know, can they respond to my attack? If not, great, right? If they can, well, then how do they do that? What are their, what are their assets? So as an attacker, that's probably one of the fundamental questions I would start up, start with up front. Like, what am I going to get out of this? Am I going to get money? Uh, you know, what are they protecting? Uh, the weaponization. So what available exploits am I going to launch? What's their patch level look like? Do they patch even? Um, delivery methods. So how will I deliver this? Am I going to walk in and drop some USBs in their elevator? Am I going to give them some links to click on? Uh, stuff like that. What's their antivirus look like? Perimeter protection, logging. Do they even log? Do they have a SIM? Hours of operation for physical access. These are great. Uh, in ingress, egress points. I want to take a look at that. Usually I look at the roof as well. What do they have on the roof? Do they have roof access? Do, what kind of HVAC equipment's up there? That's good for a number of reasons. Um, data encryption, hours of operation, backups. So do they have, you know, a company come in and get their tapes or not? Vendors are really nice to look at because I can pose as them. You know, what kind of promises have they made to the business? Can I, can I see their DRP, for example? If I can get a look at that, um, that's going to tell me a lot on how they operate if there is a, a big issue. Now we'll get into OSINT. So a lot of this is taken from my time with at the SECTF at DEF CON, but then this is also what we're doing with Trace Labs quite a bit as well, is, is a lot of OSINT focusing on how you structure it and how you proceed. This one I'll talk about today is focused more on a company, on an organization, so it's most useful for you. So I'll always start with my, my target acquisition and going through kind of a basic broad picture of the, the company, starting with the physical. So where are they based? Uh, you know, it could be where in the world are they based? What part of the city are they based? Um, you know, just from that, I'm going to get lots of information on how they operate. What kind of properties do they have? Then I'll move into the technical and I'll look at their websites, IP addresses, of course, all that stuff. And also, who registered that stuff? I like to really like to see that. So is it a person's name who registered, let's say, the website? And do I have their personal email address? Or is it, say, a DL? Because if it's just one person, that, that's great, right? I want to learn as much as I can about that single person. Uh, corporate, I'll look at their property registration, any of the legal documents online. And then once I've exhausted all of that, and there's a ton of information right there, I'll move into staff. I'll start looking at, at people. Now, people's where it gets really messy. I love people because they're so messy, right? And uh, LinkedIn is fantastic, not only for, you know, developing your career, but also for doing OSINT against an organization. The reason I say that is because it's just set up so nicely for me to pull everything I want in a really organized manner. You know, you, you click on, you type in the name of the company, you go to the company, it lists all the people, you can sort and filter by, you know, geography, location, or department, or anything like that. It even shows you people that are closely related. Uh, that's fantastic. And then in the top right corner of some people's profiles, there's a little button you can hit, and it'll give you all their other social media accounts, which saves you so much time. Um, just, just wonderful. I have to thank LinkedIn. If you send me a LinkedIn request, I will accept it, I promise, because it just expands my range, right? Uh, it, it's really nice. Uh, Recruitment Geek, um, there's a, uh, a free tool called LinkedIn X-Ray, which is great. And it'll kind of get you around some of the limitations of the free version of LinkedIn, which is annoying. So you can either pay for that or you can use this tool, uh, which will allow you to proceed without those limitations. So fantastic. Now, once, you've, once you're looking at a company, you want to start to narrow that down. Because if you're looking at a company with thousands of people, you're not going to be targeting thousands of people. I usually want to have a couple dozen people. And, um, you know, it's like the 80-20 rule, of course. So you want to look for those social butterflies. I want people that, you know, they've got some time on their hands and they're posting a lot of stuff. They've probably got blogs. They've got tons of, you know, every social media platforms full out. You know, I want people that are really active online. And look at this guy, right? Like he's, he's an extrovert. You know, he's pretty happy. He's really expressive. That's what I'm looking for. Um, 
So when I started doing this, I was terrible. And, uh, and I would use my own LinkedIn account to go look at everybody in these companies. And you know what happens when you look at, you know, a thousand people's LinkedIn accounts? They all look at yours, right? You can, you can change that. And I've, I've done that now in my LinkedIn account. So they can't see who it is that's looking at their uh, account. But you want to prepare yourself for this. Use a, a, a different account or if you're going to use your own, set it up so that not everybody in the company turns around and looks at you. Uh, you might want to set up your platform so that maybe you're using a local hypervisor or something. You know, um, Joe here was talking about the previous talk was talking about the chain of command. If you're going to use this for court, you want to make sure that that's all archived and safe. Uh, the Buscador platform by Michael Bazell is a great OSINT kind of uh, platform to use. I tend to use Kali, but there's lots of, uh, lots of other ones out there you can do. Just, just get yourself set up before, as a first step before you move forward. Some precautions. So, uh, some things, some other things you want to do to prepare yourself for your OSINT exercise. So, Hunchly is a great tool. It's up in Canada where I'm from. So, that's a, a Canadian plug there. Uh, reach out to Just, Justin. Uh, great product. That'll help you with your, uh, to organize yourself. Think about how you're going to categorize your intel. So what's important? What kind of intel are you looking for? With the SECTF, you know what you're looking for. But if you're doing this as part of your job, you want to make sure that what you're going after is important. You can spend a lot of time doing OSINT and just spinning your wheels and collecting data. Um, and that's what I was doing when I first started. You need to be really focused, though. Otherwise, you'll burn a lot of time. What data points are important, right? So do you want to just collect everything on all the employees? And I, I did that as well. My first time I had an Excel spreadsheet with everything. Their, the dog, their dog's name, you know, their home phone number, where they lived. It was crazy. And then how will your report be consumed? So if you're going to give this to somebody, think about, you know, what that's going to look like when they get it. So you probably want to have an executive summary. You probably want to have it laid out so they can easily consume it. Uh, and they're going to appreciate the value in that report. And, oh, how are you staying undetected? So we talked about that. That's, uh, that's an important thing. So you really want to make sure your reconnaissance is, is very private and, uh, not setting off any red flags. So now we're going to get into some pretext development. And, um, the way, best way to do that, I think, really, if you're going to go into the SECTF, um, or just do some pretexts, uh, for Bishing is to talk to real people. Our receptionists are great resources to talk to for this sort of thing. Um, they get nonstop all day long people walking in to the office, uh, asking them if for various things. A lot of salespeople come in. A lot of people want to meet people within the organization, but they don't have an appointment. They're not supposed to be there. So it's almost like they have this, uh, this uh, detection system built in, right? So they can automatically tell if, if something's wrong. So I ran all my pretexts through them and they would say, yeah, no, Rob, that, that's never going to work. Or yeah, that's great. So they're ex excellent at that. But I would also say that they're also excellent at protecting your company because they're kind of that, that physical human firewall, right? For people that are coming in. If I want to learn about an organization, I'll walk around the building I'll take a really good look at that. I'll do Google Street View first and all that to get familiar with it. But then I'll walk inside too. And I'll take a look at the reception, talk to her maybe about something, ask her if I can use the washroom, all those sort of things to get my initial reconnaissance. And um, and so really we should be training these people a little bit more than we do. I don't know. Most people, most receptionists probably get no training, I would guess, right? So definitely an area where we, where we can improve. All right, I'll get into the vishing component of that now. So once you've done your OSINT, you want to do some vishing against the target. And who do you look for as your marks? Who are you going to call? And um, for me, this was really trying to find people that would talk to me and give me stuff that I needed and not question my, my questions. So that actually worked out to be three kind of components. One was a low connection score on LinkedIn. I want people that are new to the industry and hopefully new to the company and that they just, they just don't know better. Right? They don't know, they don't have that good judgment. I also want people that like to talk and promote themselves and uh, really want to promote their, themselves to anybody. Uh, so a lot of selfies. If I see you taking a lot of selfies, then that's great. And uh, if you share more than necessary, that would be excellent as well. So if you tell me what your VPN is, then your, your name's on my list. So high charisma and low wisdom scores is basically what I'm looking for. And Ironically, that turns out to be interns and contractors mostly, um, which is 
I think, interesting. So we need to kind of keep an eye on our interns and, and contractors. Really, interns are new to the company, right? They probably haven't got a lot of training yet. They're new to the industry. They're just making their mark. Contractors, kind of nomadic, right? So they're moving around from company to company. They're not invested in the company. So that would probably be the reason there. All right, some social engineering techniques. So these are, for me, are typically done over the phone. Um, some of these are done within sales as well. So if somebody's selling you something, you might get some of these. You could do these in person as well. So the classic is the confirmation. So, you know, how do you like those Dell laptops? And that kind of sounds like I already know you're using Dell laptops. So you kind of assume I'm already familiar with your business somehow. So uh, it sounds very confident. Um, so you, you and, and the, the answer is either, you know, yes or no, I like them or I don't. It's not like, well, how do you know that? So very rarely do people question that. If you can swallow your pride and let people correct you, the second one works great. Um, so you would see, you know that they use Dell, for example, and you say, oh, how do you like those IBM laptops? We don't use IBM. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. So, you know, you can get them to correct you. A lot of people enjoy that correcting people, so that can work. Name dropping, this is used a lot, right, within your organization. If somebody wants you to do something, they'll say, oh, well, you know, the VP of so-and-so said we got to get this done. Um, you have to be careful with that because sometimes it's quite obvious. But um, if people question you, you can say, you know, well, I was talking to the VP or this came out of a meeting with the VP. Blowing smoke, you were recommended to work with us. So this works really well. It's used in sales a lot. Uh, you're basically giving the person a compliment, making them feel really good about themselves. And, um, you know, this, this is very effective. It's Even when it's happening to you and you know what's happening to you, it's very hard to resist, right? It's, uh, it's incredible. I, I had a social engineer, social engineer, actually social engineer me as I was walking down the street, and I didn't realize it was happening until we were five minutes into it. And he walks up, and he looks at me, and he says, hey, nice watch. And I was like, oh, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. You know, I felt really special, right? And then, you know, a minute later, I realized, oh, man, He's SEing me because he gets into his sales pitch, right? And it was like a really slow, low and slow sales pitch. But uh, man, and it just started with that. You want to make contact with somebody, get get into a conversation, just give them a compliment. Uh, impending doom. I like this one as well. Um, you know, there's going to be an event. It's going to happen. There's nothing you can do about that. It's like a tornado. It's coming to you. But I can help you. Right, so Larry's going to be on site tomorrow for site inspection. We won the HVAC RFP. Uh, yeah, I just want to know: Does he need a special card for access? Or can he use your washroom? Yeah, we want to run some diagnostics. So can he get on your Wi-Fi too while he's there? Oh, yeah, he doesn't usually pack a lunch. Can he just use your cafeteria? So um, this is really interesting. It helps to know an industry. For me, I know a lot about data centers, so I always fall back onto like HVAC and data center stuff. Uh, but whatever you know something about is is really good. Allowed to vent. Um, everybody, it, this one's tricky, so I don't always recommend it. But uh, if you can get them to complain about something, and some people are are, are very eager to do that, um, that'll often work. You know, so oh, you know, my boss yelled at me, and he wants, really wants me to get this done. I'm going to quit this job tomorrow. I think I just can't stand this anymore. Um, I actually had a, this happen for real in in an organization where this lady was crying, and um, and she came to me right after she the, that event occurred, and she told me she says oh, I'm crying, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get it together. It's like what happened, you know? She had my attention immediately, and whatever I could do to help her, I was going to do. And uh, you know, and now we're really good friends in the organization, and just from that event, right? So attackers can use this too. Smarty Pants, how did you ever figure this out? So again, that's the compliment. I'm making you feel really special. And, um, you know, you have to lower your ego for this as well. And because you have to act kind of, you know, less intelligent, right? I, I don't know how to do this. I like, how do you do this tech stuff, right? I click the button, I get blue screen. Can you help me, please? What's your password? I'll just type it in here. Okay, so <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, Zero sum. So this is great. A lot of vishing attacks will use this. We use this. It was really effective. I think it was one of our most effective vishes. And so it's like, you know, it's time sensitive. You got to click the link now or you're not going to win, right? So the first three people will win a trip to the zoo. And, um, you know, so that works really good. And if you can show the countdown too or something like that where they can actually see if there's any time left, 
uh, or any chance, then that's great. And there's always that little bit of chance just for you, right? Uh, sympathy, and uh, this works great. Like when you're driving down the street and you see the car broken down on the side of the road, right, you want to stop. A lot of people stop, right, and they want to help that person, whatever it might be. Uh, anybody, if you know, if you drop something on the ground, how many people are going to come by and help you pick that up? That's our nature, right? We don't want that to go away, but, um, you know, just know that that's, that's our nature, and some people will take advantage of that. All right, so some entry methods my, for my pretext. Um, this is the fir- first one, how to get past reception. So I, I spoke about reception, how important they are. They really protect our business. So some methods to get past them. If most companies have interns, sorry, that's an American word. In Canada, we use co-op. I'm not sure what you use here. But that's somebody who's coming from school. They want to get some work experience in your organization. And um, and those are the people that, that I typically would target because they're pretty new, right? So I'm calling from the school. Hey, can I speak to uh, Sally? She's just on her co-op here. And uh, I'd really like to get some feedback from her. Sounds really innocent. Nine out of ten receptionists will let me through. Um, industry knowledge. So if I'm calling and I give them a bunch of jargon about some, you know, HVAC maintenance, that sounds really, very legitimate too. Cause whatever question they ask, I'm going to be able to answer, uh, just cause I know I have the background with that. Uh, targeted methods. So Mitnick uses these a lot. If you've read any of his books, he's very layered in his attack, right? So you'll get a little bit of information from over here, a little bit from over there, a little bit from over there. Seems very innocent, right? But he just adds that up. It's like a layer cake, right? And just keeps building that. The enemy of my enemy. So if a company is renting from a, uh, a, a a property management company, and I want to get in on that building, maybe a particular floor, I'll phone them and say, hey, can you tell me a little bit about your property management? Are they any good? Like, I heard they're not very good. And uh, and they'll tell you all about the building, hopefully, and about that relationship. Special delivery. I used this one at DEF CON. It was one of my favorites. It's a very small attack, and I'm, I'm basically calling and I'm impersonating FedEx because it's scripted, right? So you can listen to FedEx, and anybody that does has a script that's very regular, you can just copy that. And it sounds the same every time. So anybody you use it on, especially over the phone, they're going to go, oh, yeah, that's exactly what they say. So that must be you. And they'll tell you whatever you ask. Um, so that's really nice. Uh, can I tell you a secret? This was one of my favorites. So understanding people's motivation and why they would do certain things is really important. So in the recruitment world, there's often a bonus if you can place somebody. So this was this pretext was I'm calling a company and I want to talk to their HR people. I'm an HR person. We're all HR people. So we have that bond. I have people leaving this organization because we're going to do layoffs, but I want to place them in your organization and you're going to get a bonus. I know if you get people in, right? So you're motivated actually to talk to me financially. So that's fantastic for me as an attacker, right? So you're going to stay on the phone no matter what I ask pretty much. So I'm going to tell you all about these people that want to come over to your company and I'm going to find out if you've got any openings in the near future. And I'm going to these people are amazing, right? You've got to hire them. Uh, but then I'm going to ask you about your company, and you're going to tell me a little bit about that as well. So so that's a nice one. I really like that. These are full dump methods. These are not as effective typically um, unless you're in the SECTF, in which case you only have 20 minutes. So you're just rapid fire trying to get as many points as you can. Um, one of the ones is you're a lucky winner. This is the, like the, the radio contest or... You know, we see this a lot with real attackers, um, not so much with, um, you know, sales or something like that. And uh, they're not very well done usually. You know it's an attack. They're like, okay, you, you just won. Congratulations. Please give us your username and password and all your credit card information, all your bank information. It's like, no, I don't think so. Uh, upgrade opportunity. I really like this one because the people feel they're going to get something out of it. So, you know, many of you probably have vendors. How often does the new vendor call you and, or the, sorry, the old vendor call you and introduce you to the new vendor? Usually the new vendor will call you and say, Hey, I'm your new vendor. Well, how do I know that? Right? So you could do this as an attack and just call them up. If, if you know they use Dell, Hey, I'm Rob. I'm your new Dell account rep. Uh, I just started. Don't really know what I'm doing, but I think a good first step would be just to give you some free equipment to try out. How would you like that? Sounds pretty good, right? So uh, just give me some information, and I'll send it right over. So that's how I pull that information. Uh, your special employee engagement survey. Uh, this worked really well at DEF CON. I think this could work well for any sort of attack. 
um, you know, the VP of HR said I should call you, uh, and, and she really said that you would have a really good insights into the how we can improve engagement in your company. Um, can you just answer a few questions? Who's going to say no to that? Not many people, right? Um, you know, people always want to say how, you know, you can improve engagement. My all-time favorite, and if you're doing this, um, please try this and tell me how it works. I've never had an opportunity to do it, but I really want to. When they catch you and they say, you know what? I don't think you sound legit. I don't think you're Rob from our company because he sounds different and they would never ask these questions because we had uh, security training and, and, and this just doesn't sound right. I, I'm calling, calling you on this. You say, okay, yeah, you caught me. Actually, this is, this is just a test. We're, we're, we were hired. We're a security company and you're the first person to actually, you know, question me on this. So congratulations. I'm sending you a $10 Starbucks card and, uh, can I, can I just continue through the questions though, just to get a baseline? And, uh, I've always wanted to do that. So a lot of social engineers will say stay in context no matter what's happening. Like when they're putting the handcuffs on, just stay in context. But I don't really, I think this is better than that. So just roll it. And, um, and that way you're actually congratulating them again, making them feel good again. There's no conflict. So I like that. All right. So those are some attacks, pretext. Let's get into defense here now. All right. So first, before we get into some specific things you can do, a little reflective moment. I like to ask these questions. You don't have to answer. But, you know, how would you know if your company had been socially engineered? Would people come to you and say, you know what, Rob, I just gave out our bank information to somebody? Um, real world example, someone wire transferred $50 million from a social engineering attack. That's a bad day, right? You know, I don't know how you'd explain that, right? You walk down the hall and knock on the door. It's like, ah, I got something to tell you. Uh, not good. Um, does your insurance cover that? So if I call your company and get that $50 million transferred, is that covered by insurance? I don't think so. Um, and then could you manage this risk? So probably a lot of InfoSec people here that would get the call if that happened, right? And so do you, are you set up in your IR to be able to handle that? And then uh, the old Equifax question, right? Who's getting fired? So... I, I always say, you know, if you don't know, it's probably you. I don't really like that joke because it would probably be me. But um, it's good to kind of cover yourself there, right, and have that conversation with management and executives on, on how do we deal with this? What does that look like? Because this is more than an InfoSec question. You know, wire, if, if accounting wire transfers a bunch of money or if they get tricked to pay a, uh, a bill that they never, that's not even theirs, then who's... Whose responsibility is that? I would argue it's not information security necessarily, but then we often do the training to educate our staff in this particular area so they could make it your, your issue. So I'd, I'd take a look at that. Some recommendations. Um, first, understand your exposure. So the problem to the, uh, the answer to every problem for me is like understand what that problem is and what that looks like. For me, it's the exposure. OSINT yourself. I have alerts set up in Google for my name, so I really enjoy that to see what all the other people with my name are doing in the world. Uh, OSINT your company. Find those butterflies. I guarantee you have them, and there's probably not that many. I bet you it's like, you know, two or three out of a hundred, but those two or three out of a hundred are super active. And then understand what's at risk. So what does your company have to lose? Probably money for sure, reputation for sure, and then what else, right? Uh, build up your defenses against phishing. So some of these you're not going to do, but I recommend them anyway. So do a phishing program, uh, measure uh, reporting and not just clicks, right? So how many people are talking to IT when they get that weird email? We did our program years ago, and it has still left us in a much better situation. So we still get people, a lot of people coming to IT saying, yeah, I got this weird email. Is this legit or not? What do you think I should do? Fantastic, right? They're not clicking. They're walking over and we're having a conversation. Uh, you could put EXT for all incoming email in the subject line. Um, I mean, there's, there's, it's not foolproof, but it's, a, it could help. You could stop all active links and some actual agencies, I think, do this. Probably not practical for you. Um, and then provide safer alternatives to email. Email is brutal. I have so little time in the day. I spend about two seconds processing an email and I either delete it or then I have to do something with it. But, you know, it's super quick. You're probably getting hundreds of emails, I'm betting, per day, right? 
So it's ridiculous. So Slack, Twitter, whatever you want to do, um, I would just try to get away from email. Build up your defenses. So fish your executive. Of course, you want to have a conversation with them first. Don't just go do it. That could be career ending. Uh, but those are the big targets, right? Those are the whales. Those are the people that can sign the checks. Those are the people that can transfer the money. Create choke points. Again, comes back to the receptionist, especially for your physical pen testing. Um, they do a lot that you're probably not aware of. Um, they're amazing. Uh, PBX, I love it when I can call into your PBX and probably do that at night and do die by name there. It's fantastic. It's usually like a Cisco PBX and I'll, I'll know the commands already so I can navigate through that real easy. And I can pretty much get everything from that, uh, name, title, um, you know, extension if you've got one. Then your, your voicemail will say, oh, I'm in Mexico. So great. You're on holiday. Who's your acting, whatever you are. Uh, so then I'll get that person's information. Sometimes your cell phone number's on there, which is even better. I love cell phone numbers. Uh, DIDs, you probably don't need a DID. I would bet most people in this room, unless, unless you're sales, which there's no sales you said in this room, you probably don't need a DID. So, you know, direct inward dial. So just have an extension, can go through reception, she can grill them. Stop answering your phone. Uh, I did this talk internally and there was a bunch of managers in the room and they all just glared at me when I said, don't stop answering your phone. I almost never answer the phone. Um, a lot of my phones will go to voicemail and then I'll just get emailed to me and then I'll listen to it. And if it's, you know, and then I delete it or I phone you back. Um, but people typically will text me and it's like, Hey Rob, I got to call you. Okay, good. Um, I don't want to waste my time with some, you know, congratulations. You just want a trip to wherever, right? Um, get on the offensive. So no one reads policies. I'm sorry. No matter how good your policy is, I would argue that very few people are reading that. The ones I've written, I don't read them ever. Um, so what we need to do is try to change the culture a little bit, right? So c continual challenges with goals, right? Start to gamify it. I love the, I love gamification. I try to gamify everything. Um, and then, so you have programs like once a month. With information security, we typically don't get out there enough. We don't get out with the group um, and advertise our services so there's not the value recognition that you deserve. And that's a lot because of the optics, right? So when there's a problem, oh, they find you, right? But when things are going great, do they come by and say, hey, you're doing a great job, right? So this gives you an opportunity to do that. You can go out there once a month, get a picture of you giving somebody a Starbucks card saying, hey, you won, great job. You actually came and and, and said you, you had this weird email and we investigated and sure enough, that was a bad thing, right? Start giving out Starbucks cards. You have What's the popular coffee place here? Is it Starbucks? Yeah? Okay. I thought it'd be something better, but because not a big Starbucks fan myself, but everybody goes there. All right, cultural change. So we can't scale to the attackers, right? So the, the, the problem that we always talk about is, oh, they only have to be lucky once. And, uh, oh, how do we stop people from just drafting in and tailgating in through the door? Well, you can't. You are never going to shut the door on a pregnant lady carrying 10 pizzas, right? It's just not going to happen. Like, who does that? So, but what we can do is we can start to, to create this, this um, culture of protectionism, right? So if you're proud and, and happy and engaged where you work, right? I think a lot of this comes back to employee engagement. If you're happy to be there, you're not going to want the company to be at risk. So when the lady comes to the door with all the pizzas and you don't know who that is or she doesn't have a card on, right, you're going to say, hey, can I help you with that? Um, let me take you into reception and we can, we can, we can get you processed there, right? So you're not shutting the door on this poor lady, but you're, you're making sure that she's not going to just draft in and then throw the pizzas in the garbage and go straight to your, your data center or wherever she's going. So, so we can be polite, professional, but then also be proud of where we work and, and protect her company. We can create heroes and, and, and celebrate that with, with these people that are doing great work. Tools and resources, because everybody asks for this. Um, these change all the time. So start with the physical. No surprises here. I love YouTube. Why? Because I can do it frame by frame, and it's great. Little things in the background. I had like card access stuff that I picked up where people would just kind of pull it out and swipe to go in that I could see. I'll, I'll, I'll actually map out the floors and I can see the CCTV cameras. Uh, you know, if there's a uh, tour of the office, especially those are fantastic. Uh, for individuals, I like to see what kind of YouTube stuff they're making because they'll film their house, they'll film where they go to work, they'll film their friends, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, LoopNet for commercial, Street View, of course. You know, I always start everything with Street View. 
Um, sometimes it's old. What you can do is actually with Street View, you can pick the different years. Um, you can actually go back in time to see how it's changed, which is nice. I like to look at any websites that will give me property information, court information, anything like that is golden. I also like to look at anything that's outside of the property. So start with Street View, identify the infrastructure, and then start to look at what that infrastructure is. So, you know, you want to look for fences, gates, sensors, uh, HVAC on the roof, uh, access cards, parking is great, right? So identify who their parking company is. Um, that allows you to act as them if you want, uh, food delivery, uh, all those sort of things. If you're going to recon the, the place, you want to be able to know where to park, right? All those sort of things. Uh, technical, uh, this list goes on and on. Wiggle is great for SSIDs. Uh, it's actually pretty accurate too. Um, so I can, I can look at that on the map and figure out what their SSID is. Uh, DNS information, website information. Yeah, there's endless, <clears throat> endless resources for this, right? Some are better than others. These are not bad. But I uh, definitely want to zone in on who, who actually registered all their stuff. Who's that individual? What's that person's contact information? Is it a group? And then I'll go on LinkedIn. I'll find out everything about that person and just go from there. Corporate. Uh, Indeed is great. I love it how they have, uh, how you put all your technology into your job descriptions, right? So looking for a person who knows how to configure a Cisco uh, firewall or, or Palo Alto or, you know, knows how to do a uh, Cisco 4500 switch or, you know, all those sort of things, that's, that's awesome for me. Uh, Glassdoor as well. A lot of discussions around uh, how much people like the company, what's wrong with the company. Um, that's often their venting, so you get a lot of good information from that. Pastebin, for some reason, you can find a lot of information around the, in there. Uh, that's quite often reference letters. I don't know why that's used for reference letters, but you can get the executive's information from that because um, it'll often be signed off by an important person in the company. Um, focus on security guards. If you can find out what company that is, that's helpful. Uh, and then staff, of course, right? So I mentioned... Uh, this um, recruitment geek, geek tool uh, to get around the LinkedIn limitations. Instagram, Instagram's a, a big one. So people that talk about OSINT, uh, they'll focus on Instagram a lot. It definitely pays dividends. It's fantastic. Um, sorry, SlideShare was the one for reference letters. So I got that mixed up with uh, Pastebin, didn't I? Pastebin is great. Set up a keyword search for the company in Pastebin and you can find a lot of stuff about them on that. Uh, in Canada, um, I can go to this site here and find criminal records on people. And so I always like to plug everybody's name into that. Uh, the reason I do that is not only do you get the criminal record information, but also you get information on any aliases they have, uh, which is really, really interesting. And then, of course, personal websites. Um, usually a lot of people have their resume online, uh, and they have a lot of inf information on their personal website, phone, home phone at, phone number, address, all that sort of stuff. Now, this is a uh, cheat sheet that I put together um, just to encapsulate all your, well, a lot of defense things that you could do. They're not all social engineering per se, but they're going to help you protect you against social engineering. This was a huge list, and I just tried to take everything out that wasn't you know, kind of specific to social engineering. But you know, removing your specific technologies from job descriptions, just talk about network stuff in general. You don't have to say, uh, you know, the, the vendors that you use and things like that. Uh, assume your, your, your technical posts are read by really bad people because they are, right? Everything from agencies to really bad people, right? Uh, train your users. If you haven't done a phishing or vishing program, now's a good time to do it. Uh, I would do it in a way that you're not offending everybody. You can do it really poorly. Um, I would celebrate people that do it, that, that actually don't click the link rather than punishing people that do. Uh, auto log off, of course, uh, micro segmentation. I love, um, products like, um, uh, what is the NSX where you're, you're not only doing, you're not just doing VLANing, you're actually micro segmenting. Um, and you could do that physically too, right? So you, your key card doesn't give you access to everywhere. 2FA everything, of course, especially webmail. Uh, privacy screens. So when people are on the bus, they can't look over your shoulder and see that. Corporate stickers, like you don't need to advertise where you work on your on your laptop because then it's even more valuable. Um, automating it so you remove this human decision factor, right? So if people don't have to decide uh, about, oh, should I forward this call or not, and different things like that, it's very helpful. 
Um, create choke points. So I talked about that. So if they do get into your building, they can't go everywhere. And use CCTV for active monitoring. Quite often we just put it up. And then a few months later we realize, oh, it's not recording. So if somebody's actually looking at that, that's much more helpful. All right, some resources. These are a few out of many. Uh, if you want more resources on particular areas, uh, focus, let me know. Uh, Michael Bazell, the first one, Intel Techniques. You can't go wrong with that as a starting point. Amazing webcast, uh, or podcast rather, articles, tools. You can just go to the website and there's so, so many little tools there you can use. <coughs> um, in Canada, Toddington is a great resource for training. Uh, of course, the social engineer, he runs the village at DEF CON. He's also got tons of tools. Uh, and then if you want to really get into the um, kind of psychology behind it, uh, Robert Caldini is great. Lots of YouTube videos about him. I know he gets into the principles of influence, which is really handy as well. But talk to me if you want something specific. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions at all? Don't be shy. This is the last one. Anybody? That's your last chance? Yeah! I'm happy I have some job now. Hello, great talk. Hi. I was listening today to a podcast, and they were explaining that the, there was a CISO of AT&T, and she was explaining that they, she did a phishing campaign mm -hmm. where she was sending first an email from help desk, mm -hmm. sending, we will send you... Uh, we will send you another email to a website so you can test how strong is your password. Oh, yeah. Love it. And then it. she was saying that they sent it to 40 people and 32 of them like actually put the email in there. Yeah. In the website. And That's like the great. other eight didn't do it because the password was crap. So they didn't <laughs> want to put it there. But it made me think, is that a good technique? Because you are using hmm. a legit yeah. email from help desk that should yeah. be someone distrusted. What do you yeah. think about it? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I would hesitate to do that one. I, I like to be really tricky with people and to, to try to get them to click the link, but within reason, right? So we all work together. Um, our relationship is very important, especially if I'm a leader in the organization. I want to be very respectful to who I'm working with. I mean, I want to ideally be respectful to everybody, but because you see me every day, if I irritate you or insult you, not a good idea, right? So... I, I also want to make you more likely to call the help desk, right? And to, and to not be confused by any messaging or, that they give you. So, uh, I don't like that one. I think it was highly effective because people trust the help desk, uh, and we're trained to go to them. So if they send me something, I'll probably act on it. So uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I don't think, I think it was effective, but not appropriate. So yeah, you have to be careful with, with vishing or phishing. If you do a program, because yeah, you, you, maybe you want to trick some people and then help them get better, but you have to make sure you do that in a very respectful way. And so, yeah, that, that's a great example of maybe not what, what not to do. So thank you. So you said uh, that you would also look at whether a building has rooftop access and uh, that you can gain a lot from that. And yeah. I can't, uh, what, why? <laughs> what yeah, does that so tell the, you? The, the roof is often overlooked when you're doing reconnaissance, especially physical reconnaissance. And uh, a lot of infrastructure for the building will be on the roof. So you'll have not only rooftop access for some vendors that need to go up there, uh, but you'll also have equipment up there, and, such as the comfort cooling for, for this building probably has, it's on the roof. So you'll see these big boxes. They look like big steel boxes that'll be up there and they will feed all that air conditioning. So I want to learn about that. Uh, I will count how many they have. I might even be able to zoom in and see the vendor name on the side of it. Quite often from the outside, it's very hard to see the branding of, of who those vendors are that are providing services to the building. So unless you can get into the loading dock 
or some peripheral services such as parking. Parking will often advertise because if your car gets a ticket or gets towed, you need to know who to call. But other than that, it's usually uh, difficult to get a to be able to impersonate a, a vendor that operates in the area. Um, sometimes buildings will be for rent, so you'll see the uh, property management company name, so that's a good one. But on the roof, because nobody's going up there, they they don't worry about it too much. But from Google Street View, I can sometimes zoom in and actually get a lot of information there, which is good. So if I'm impersonating the vendor, I can say, you have six HVACs on your roof, and uh, the largest one, which is in the southwest corner, that's the one we're doing maintenance on. So if they're familiar with their own building, then they're going to go, oh, oh yeah, he obviously works here because he knows all that. So that's why I, why I like it for the most part. Anybody? Okay, then thank you very much thank for you. your talk. <laughs>